long, especially uh, given the weather. You do me great honour. Um, my company, just, just to put things in context, my company, X, yeah, if you go to our website, you'll find that we're a microprocessor company and we make microcontrollers. Um, actually, that's what we did. What we're actually doing now is something completely different along the lines of this talk. Now, I feel like a little bit of a fraud because I'm standing here, I'm about to talk about some stuff in very vague terms that we are doing that we can't tell you much about. And, uh, well, if Rob invites me back in two years' time, then I'll tell you what we did in somewhat more detail. But for now, I apologise in advance for being a little bit obtuse, but it's certainly not what's on Xmos's website, and uh, it's certainly a lot more exciting than that. It's a very strange way of starting a new chip company to sort of use the shell of an old one, so if you like, we're doing that. So I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, not in any great detail, um, I told the original slot was an hour, I probably won't talk that long. Since we've signed that, it's quite convenient. Yeah. If I do talk that long, I'm going to be wittering too much. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what sort of machines we're going to need in the future for intelligent computing. Because I think that intelligent computing is quite different from all the computing we've had so far. Um, if you like, we've had 70 years of dumb computing. 72, is it now? Losses December 43, so it'll be about 71 and a half. Um, and we're just starting to see real intelligence being deployed uh, to considerable commercial value. I'd say that machine learning has been worth billions of dollars to cloud commerce for at least a decade. So this is not sort of research stuff. This is stuff that's happening today that people are prepared to pay a high price for today which of course is why, as a chip company, we are interested in. Right, first of all, what is intelligence? As many of you may have heard from various presenters, nobody can agree what intelligence is. These small psychologists that have spent the last couple of centuries at least trying to define it. Um, I think pragmatically, as engineers, we can use this definition. So intelligent computing, or intelligence in general, tries to solve problems which are intractable to algorithm, and they may be intractable for various reasons. They may be NP hard, but there is no algorithm apart from searching the space. Um, or we just can't conceive an algorithm. Um, recognize your mother, recognize your dog. <laughs> you cannot do it. You can't write an algorithm to do it. Um, or sometimes there's just not enough information. Um, and I always give the example of vision. Uh, as, as a good example of that, vision is probably 50% of all use of machine learning, to be frank, understanding pictures. Um, but when we see something, I see you all sat here, of course, I don't, I don't see you in 3D, I see two projections of you in 2D. Some of you are sat behind others. My mind does not tell me that only a part of a person exists. It allows me to believe that you all exist. And, and I am clearly making that up, because there's no, that information doesn't exist in the 2D viewpoint that I have. So that's the vision to me is a canonical example of an intelligent algorithm. It's something where the data has to be augmented by a set of beliefs, something that I have established by my experience. And machines will have to do the same to be able to be capable of vision. Um, you won't just be able to write algorithms without embedding somehow in the machine an expectation of what the 3D world looks like. You might embed that expectation as a very clever program. I think that's what vision people have been trying to do for several decades. But now we know probably a better way to embed that expectation is to let the machine wander about and see things and learn from what it sees. So intelligence requires experience, and experience just means that you need a model as well as a program. And the model has to come from some data. Um, probably it's going to come from learning process rather than someone making the data up. The early days of AI were all about making data up and labeling it, which was found to be far too expensive, time consuming and ineffective. So now it's all about not labeling it, but letting machines work out what's what in the same way as people do. Um, and all the results of intelligent computing algorithms are probabilities. In fact models are probabilities, the probability distributions over all the possible things that you might believe in. A machine might believe in. Um, so, 
If you do an intelligent computation, what you will get out is a probability distribution. You won't get facts. You'll get, you know, there's a 99% chance that that's a car and a 1% chance that it's an aeroplane. 0.1% chance that it's a horse, for example. <laughs> so there has to be something else in an intelligent machine to decide what to do with that. And I guess if it's a driving assistance system for a car, then that policy engine is going to be pretty conservative. Um, if it's a, shall I invest in this stock or shall I not invest in this stock, then you might be up for a bigger level of risk. Um, but there has to be a decision policy, and that's completely orthogonal to the question of intelligent computing. That's, that's really a risk weighting function. Of course, decision policy machines might also be intelligent. They might learn where risks are worth taking. But we won't go into that. Um, <clears throat> and like people, that means intelligent computers can correctly compute incorrect answers. This is something that the journalists and the media haven't quite got their heads around yet with regard to self-driving cars. It will crash, of course. It will crash correctly. Um, and our only hope is that they'll crash less often than we do. <coughs> and I'm sure that will come. Absolutely sure. I'm not as sure as Elon Musk is that it's already a done deal. In fact, I, I met the chap who coined the SLAM algorithm a couple of weeks ago. It's a simultaneous location and mapping, which is a robot navigation um, inference procedure. And uh, he was fuming somewhat at the fact that Elon Musk had basically said SLAM is a done deal. And he's got several decades to go yet. Anyway, moving on. <clears throat> so, I, I like the title. It's round about what well, this now, or a few years ago. And it signals the end of the privacy of the program. We're used to computers doing what the program says. And what the program says is what the programmer intended. That is ending. Um, it doesn't mean that there won't be any programmed. But it means the program will be augmented by the action or the information contained in the model. Now, Niklaus Worth famously said programming calls it code plus data structure. So maybe I'm not saying anything new here. I think it's a question of degree. The model in this, in the case of machine, an intelligent machine, will be the dominant determinant <coughs> of what the machine does. It won't be a secondary thing. Uh, and in the future, as well as programmers, therefore, there will be people who train machines. Many machines may train, them to train themselves, but I expect people will also be involved. So I don't know how many of you are or have been programmers, but in the future there may be people in this room who are trainers, and that will be one of the first questions you ask each other when you meet in the BCS. Are you a programmer or a trainer? <laughs> <laughs> These models uh, have uh, various characteristics, which I'll go into um, during the course of the next few um, slides, but in particular, they're very large. At least most of the useful ones are very large. Um, we have people currently exploring and finding utility in deep neural network models, for example, with 100 million parameters. Now, interestingly, it makes perfect sense in some of these structures for the number of parameters to exceed substantially the number of training samples. Anyone with a classical background in statistics or signal processing will be troubled by that statement. But nevertheless, it's true. And it's not, it's not bad either, you get better results. So in many cases, the parameter space is bigger than the data space. It is huge. That obviously is a disadvantage. Um, an advantage is that it, is, it exposes massive parallelism. The sort of parallelism that Amdahl never conceived of, which is why we've been frightened of <coughs> trying to build highly parallel machines ever since, because we thought no application would ever have that sort of parallelism. If we talk now about billion order parallelism, that would not be an exaggeration for these machines. So we can think more laterally about how big and how parallel a machine we could build. <clears throat> now the parameters themselves represent effectively uh, dimensions in an extremely high dimensional model space. So if you've got a billion parameters, you've got a billion dimensional space. Now parameters generally, parameters of the model, are generally things that you might regard as features. That's a sort of easy thing to understand in a vision context, but they're concepts. If you, if you were to talk about understanding speech, you might go through a hierarchy of <coughs> concepts from 
fairly used of words to sentence constructs to a sort of conversational state speech. Um, <clears throat> and what the model is trying to capture is where various features that it has observed are correlated to each other. So if it sees one thing, it can deduce what other things might be relevant. So if it sees a pair of round circular objects <laughs> it's looking for people, it can start to correlate that it might be seeing a face, for example. Um, now if this dimensional, very high dimensional <coughs> space was fully occupied, um, then of course the amount of data in it would be astronomical. You can't possibly have a, a billion times a billion correlate even represented by one bit of information. So for these things to be useful, actually they have to be sparse. And they almost always are in most practical applications. Um, sparse anyway. Think of a vision system. It's highly unlikely that a pixel will be related to pixels on the other side of the image. Sometimes they are. Actually my foot is related to my head because it's joined by my body, but that's kind of a pretty high order concept that I didn't worry about when I first observed those pixels. But pixels next to each other are often very similar, so often very highly correlated. Um, so you can see that in the vision problem, there's a pretty high degree of sparsity. Uh, and there has to be, otherwise, uh, I think it was um, Bellman who type coined the term cursive dimensionality. Basically said, unless there's enormous sparsity to balance the enormous dimensionality, the complexity of training goes up exponentially with the number of dimensions. Fortunately, that turns out not to be a problem like most of these absolutes. Um, now, the nice, uh, a nice way of representing uh, highly sparse structures is with graphs. And I'll keep going back to the graphs as a, a theme for this kind of intelligent computing as we go along. Uh, you can represent it, of course, with a sparsely occupied matrix, a connectivity matrix, but it will be pretty empty. Um, you can represent it with adjacency lists or whatever, but whatever your representational format, what you're really capturing is a graph where the vertices are concepts, features, and the edges are correlations between them. And usually the edges are represented by probability distributions. Um, so they're not they're not necessarily just numbers um, or just existences, billions. They're, they're often more complicated than that. <clears throat> Um, the other interesting thing is that often these models have high topological dimension. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the, the difference in concept between topological dimension and spatial dimension. The topological dimension is a measure of the um, structural complexity of a graph. Uh, it effectively is the dimension of the space that you would need to embed that graph such that things that are local topologically can be local physically. It's a bit obtuse, doesn't it? Think of it in terms of memories we build today. We build linearly addressed memories today, so they are one dimensional. We could, in fact, build two dimensional memories with two addresses. And I can name at least one company that has done that, uh, from Mosaic in Cambridge about 15 years ago, um, dealing with images. It was quite handy. Um, but we're sort of limited to two dimensions as an embedding substrate, um, at least in silicon for the time being. Most of these graphs have somewhat higher dimensionality than that. So what that means is things that are related to each other topologically, in other words, vertices that are connected to each other, generally cannot be placed next to each other in memory. And this is vitally important. In fact, this will be the main thing of the talk. Really. If you cannot achieve locality in memory, then all of the structures that we have evolved to accelerate computers and processors for the last 50 years tend not to work. Um, uh, and I've been doing it for 30 of those 50 years, <laughs> so I'm as pained by that as anyone else. <laughs> I will come to that shortly. Uh, fortunately, again, uh, these things have a nice way of fixing themselves, don't they? The structure of useful models often turns out to limit their dimension to something not as frightening as infinity. Actually, the, the dimension of a random graph with V vertices in <coughs> is, is V, the topological dimension. If it's a truly random graph, so that would be a catastrophe. Fortunately, they're very rarely that high. 
So let's look at some of the shapes of graph structure that we might encounter, or we do encounter already, in uh, machine learning. So I, I'm not a machine learning expert. Obviously, I've uh, had to find out a bit about it. Some of you probably know more about it than I do. Um, and I should caution that uh, fashion moves fast in this field. So, so I'll show you a few at the moment, which are quite fashionable. But if you go back five or ten years, it'll be a different set. So I won't show you decision forests, for example, random decision forests. That was certainly five years ago the most used machine learning model form. Five years before that, it was probably support vector machines. They were starting to fall out of fashion. Now it's the thing that I'm going to show you. Right, mark off random fields. Um, <clears throat> a nice regular lattice. Doesn't have to be square. It could be any shape, it could be hexagons. Um, doesn't have to be two dimensional, actually. Uh, one dimensional mark off fields are used in speech, linear signals. Two dimensions are most common in images. You can build three dimensions or more. Um, but what the Markov random field tries to express is a strong set of prior beliefs in locality of something represented at the nodes of the graph. It's easiest to think of this in terms of images and in terms of these sorts of applications. So imagine each of these nodes is a pixel. And your job is to take a set of noisy pixels of an image and try and reduce the amount of noise. Wow. You might apply a Markov random field to that problem. <clears throat> and what the Markov random field might embody, for example, is each pixel, each vertex, might have a belief in the state of its color or intensity or whatever. That belief would be a probability distribution over different colors. And it might exchange that belief with its neighbours. Say, so I think I'm 65% red. What do you think? And its neighbours might say, well, that's odd, because I'm pretty sure I'm green. And the, the exchange of information with the neighbours might cause me, as a picture I've got four neighbours, or exchange neighbours. If they were all green, then I thought I was red, I might change my mind. So I'm going to skew myself a bit towards green then, because it's quite likely that I'm the same colour as they are, because they are my neighbours. So that's what I mean by a strong belief about locality. And that algorithm, I have barely described the algorithm, but the algorithm is called belief propagation, actually UP belief propagation. Um, and often that you do a few tens of iterations of exchanging probability distributions of a belief state, and you will achieve a pretty good denoiser. Um, it's not actually guaranteed even to converge with loops in a graph. You can prove that it will converge from a tree, but not with loops, but it does as often is the case with engineering. Now, another example is depth from disparity. So imagine I've got a stereo image pair, and they're almost the same, but they're slightly different because there's parallax between them. And my job is to find out what the depth of each pixel is. So I apply one pixel from the same location in my image. I might need some registration pre-processing, but one pixel from each of the stereo pair is now out of the and what they are now doing is exchanging beliefs about um, <clears throat> what their depth is. And so they will each contain a probability distribution over possible depths, it could be a histogram. Um, and uh, they will exchange their distribution with each other and reach a general conclusion about what's most likely. Now, what that tends to do, of course, if you express too strong a belief in locality, is it tends to enforce locality. So things like edges, you know, where one thing is behind another, and depth really does change suddenly, can be blurred out. Uh, so you can build more complicated Markov random fields, where another node, in this case the blue node, is looking at um, what's going on in this um, vertex. And if, for example, he sees that two of the neighbours think they're at one depth, and another two think they're at a completely different depth, and what the blue node might do is turn off the edges that are causing that belief to be transmitted to the node. So the node is not biased by things which are real severe differences. And probably that severe difference means something. Um, and you can build much, much more complex um, hierarchies of beliefs. And of course, you don't have to just talk to your neighbours, you can talk to your neighbours' neighbours and actually the significance of them. But anyway, that's the idea of Markov random field. <clears throat> it's a nice regular structure. I can chop that up into myriad pieces very easily. I can run it on parallel processes very easily. 
and uh, it doesn't have that many edges for the, the text on it's perfectly scaled. Two dimensional, so I can embed it in two dimensions, which is good because that's the number I've got. Um, right, neural nets, you've all heard of these. Um, this is a not very deep neural net, this typical state of the art today. They've been used about 10 layers deep, and you might find one or two thousand neurons in each layer. So I hesitate to say in practice because most of the results are also research results. They are being used to do things like character recognition, um, language translation, um, prediction of what you're about to say next, that sort of thing. Uh, and all of these things I can do for this utility in going forward. Uh, <clears throat> certainly deep neural nets and what I'm going to talk about shortly, uh, convolutional neural nets, are the two high fashion structures of today. Um, and uh, in fact, groups of experts in those spaces have been acquired for billions, literally billions of dollars. So there's certainly value associated with, uh, with these structures. <clears throat> now, deep neural nets are much more intensely connected. They, they're still sparse because you've got this layer-wise sparsity. So things in this layer are not connected generally to this layer. Say so generally, they can be. <laughs> generally they're not. Generally, there's a layer-wise structure. However, within each layer, um, potentially we have complete connectivity. So, so that has very high dimension. If it's dimension equal to the number of vertices. Um, now, that, you can interpret that as a problem, um, or because it's only a mapping from one set of vertices to another set of vertices, you can interpret it as a dense matrix. So if you've got a machine that does dense matrix calculations, it might be quite good. Of course, that's what GPUs are. So GPUs tend to get used for these things. They're quite good at uh, deep neural networks. What's generally going on in a deep neural network is a layered extraction of uh, features again. They're usually not called features in the DNN space. I don't know why. Um, they're, they're referred to as hidden neurons, but you can think of them as features. So in the first layer, you've got um, your input data, whatever it is, pixels of a picture, or samples from a filter bank running on a voice uh, signal, for example. Um, the second layer tries to produce essentially a set of basis functions as to how those first level things might be constructed from primitives. Um, so in the voice case, you might have a set of basis functions that are like a Fourier spectrum or a, uh, a similar spectrum, wall spectrum perhaps. Um, and then in the second layer, you're basically repeating that exercise so trying to find a higher level to correlate. So if this was intended to um, interpret speech very crudely, this might be sounds, this might be uh, phonemes or frequency groups, this might be words, <laughs> and this might be concepts. Usually they, don't, they need to be a bit deeper for all that stuff to happen, but uh, that's the idea. You've got a hierarchy of semantic content. Um, it's all feed forward. Almost all of the examples you'll see at the moment are all feed forward in use. There's feedback when these things are learning and they're learning to adapt their weights. Each of these edges has a weight associated with it, which, which indicates the significance of that layer to that layer. Um, <clears throat> but um, there are no loops in either training or, um, or in inference, and uh, well, yeah, that's wrong, <laughs> because uh, your brain has more backward paths, your cortex at least has more backward paths than it has forward paths. Um, there's much more traffic going backwards. When you, when you see something on your retina, it starts stimulating upward signals through your cortex. The amount of traffic comes back down again is much greater than when it's going up. So obviously, recurrence is really important. Um, there's been some useful uh, and very interesting work um, relating currents, recurrence to memory. You can imagine if you have a recurrence path, then a signal can keep looping around and it can therefore be stored temporally. Whereas in a purely feed-forward structure, that's just a map. There's no storage in there. Um, and there are a million structures for recurrence. Potentially anything can feed back to anything else. Um, 
So uh, here I've just drawn uh, in each pair a single loop back uh, between hidden neurons. In this case, we've got a cluster of the whole of one layer going back to input neuron. For every researcher, you'll find a different structure. They all have interesting properties. Um, uh, <coughs> the, um, the most interesting work is, is, is probably uh, the stuff that falls under this heading, which, which stands for long short term memory. Bit of an oxymoron, <laughs> long short term memory. So if you're interested, uh, look that one um, Now, the other thing about uh, neural networks. Um, is that when they're trained, most of those uh, connections turn out not to be very useful. Um, again, again, it comes down to this sparsity property. Um, it's highly unlikely that everything is correlated to everything else. If it is, there's not much we can do. Um, but you don't know what is going to be relevant while you're training it. So after you've trained it, um, then you can knock out quite a few of those things. And I think in anger, that's what's going to happen. Um, with deployments of intelligent machines in quite a few areas. So, for example, um, I met with some uh, a very large company who's working on driver-assisted systems for cars. Um, they're not a company that you would expect to have large supercomputers, but they are building large supercomputers to train deep neural networks to spot bicycles and pedestrians and read road signs. <laughs> and uh, the training takes a very long time, but but partly because it's fully interconnected, very deep networks. Um, and then, of course, what they want to do is they want to take that trained model and embed it in a cheapest chips camera that they can stick in the bunker of the car. Um, and part of that downsizing of, uh, uh, of uh, expense comes from the fact that actually the inference process is very much easier than the learning process. But part of it also comes from knocking out a lot of the data. Um, and uh, this is interesting piece of research from the uh, University of Montreal a few years ago uh, that tried to measure exactly how much you could knock out in a set of test cases. In this case, they managed, they actually got the best result if you did knock them out, but a better result than if you left it all in. <laughs> um, and they managed to knock out 82 of those links. So you've got a sparsity, you know, the, the contents of your connection mm -hmm. matrix is, is only one twentieth of what, sorry, one fifth of what it could be. Um, so another structure that's interesting and very fashionable at the moment is convolutional neural network. And uh, I tried to draw one of these, but then I found this much better picture from uh, <coughs> Mr. Cyrus N, so I had to use his instead. Um, so a convolutional neural network is very similar in fact, to a deep neural network. It's just that it borrows that idea of locality from the Markov field. Um, so convolutional neural networks are specifically focused uh, today at least, on image understanding. So they tend to start off with data which is two dimensions uh, and try and classify what that data means. So you might start off with a two dimensional map of pixels, probably three of them, red, blue and green, possibly depth as well. Um, and then what you do is you run a convolutional mask defined by a much smaller set of weights across that, across the whole of that. Uh, and for each position of the mask, um, you produce um, a map which is the convolved version of the uh, mask with the pixels in that area. And you can have many masks. So this particular mask might be looking for things of a particular shape, like light, vertical lines. Um, another one might be looking for horizontal lines. Another one might be looking for 45 degree lines, 33 degree lines. One might start looking for circles, especially if it wants to find out people, for example. Um, and they are often as crude as that. <clears throat> and uh, in the early days, of course, of vision, um, that's exactly what people were doing, but they were, they were doing it um, manually, designing these features manually, things like half filters, for example. Big banks of filters with manually designed features. Now, the interesting thing about the convolutional neural net is it that makes no assumption as to what the useful convolutions are. Interestingly, if you try it out on an image set, it tends to come up with hard-like filters. <laughs> but if you try it on something completely different, then it will come up with different things. And the idea is to allow the learning algorithm to find out, to discover suitable uh, convolutional models. Uh, and usually, the amount of data extracted from the image is much greater than the amount of data in the image. So again, that's this. Strange idea of there being more parameters than there is data. 
Um, <clears throat> but if you think of it in terms of those little features, of course, you can imagine lots and lots of different types of different features you can build in it if you're just scanning the image for that feature. Um, then what you do is you take that set of features and you, you try to combine those to find super features. So I might have started off looking for circles and then eventually I get more sophisticated and look for concentric circles and hope of finding eyes. Or perhaps I look for eyes, the circles next to each other, circles a certain distance apart from each other. Um, that allows me to do things like recognize faces. I a nose shaped feature, a vertical bar, and between two circles. That's, that's a pretty good hint. Um, and the idea of hierarchy uh, through a reasonable depth is of critical importance in convolutional neural nets, just as it is in deep neural nets. I would say that's because they are basically the same thing. A convolutional neural net is a deep neural net with this spatial locality assumption. And that saves an enormous amount of data um, <clears throat> because the set of parameters that are used for this convolutional mask are reused for every position of that mask in the source data. The same applies here when I, when I have a convolutional mask here. The same parameters are used at every location here. So I get to share a lot of what would otherwise be separate links that would have to be separately learned in a deep neural network. Now, on the one hand, that means that the learning can be much faster. Um, on the other hand, it means that you are embedding an assumption about uh, locality and about spatial invariance. You're assuming that a feature detector that you're learning is equally useful everywhere in the image, which in many cases is true. Now, there are some other things that people do in convolutional neural nets, um, which most people agree are probably, probably you could describe them as a slight embarrassment. Um, it's pretty clear they shouldn't be there, but they work. Um, so they, <laughs> they're there. And the most obvious one of those is, is a thing called pooling. If you look at a convolutional neural net structure, you'll usually find layers of convolutions followed by layers of pooling. What pooling does is it averages out the convolutional result over another short, uh, small local area. Now the argument for pooling is it gives you a degree of translational invariance. I like just to detect whether there's a circle. So if I average over a local area my circle detectors, then it just tells me whether there's a circle somewhere in that area. So it gives me a degree of invariance. Now, the reason why we know that's not a good idea is because we know that people are acutely sensitive to the relative position of features. So the separation of your eyes is a big clue as to who you are when I look at you. The distance from your eyes to your hairline, that sort of thing. Uh, and what we've done with pooling, of course, is we've slurged all that data out of the way. So all the relative stuff's gone because we're looking for translation invariance. So it's a bit of a trade-off. On the one hand, we would like translation invariance, um, and scale invariance and rotational invariance and all the rest of it. Um, on the other hand, uh, we know that actually that relative data is important. So it might just defeat it. Now, finally, the other thing we have is at the back end of a convolutional neural network, we have a conventional neural network uh, of could be deep or more shallow. Um, <coughs> but at the end, there is an all to all connectivity between the last few layers of neurons. Um, and that is what it is in the end that, that classifies what you've seen. Um, so these, you might end up with thousands of hyper features that are really quite difficult to describe human meaning to, but which somehow are components of semantic concepts that we're interested in, like bicycle, person, cat. The other thing with deep, uh, convolutional neural networks, which is not much explored at the moment, because we all have GPUs, and GPUs are vector machines, and vectors come in nice square boxes. <laughs> but actually, your eye doesn't have nice square boxes. We don't have, we don't have square retinal cells. They, they tend to be more like that. Um, and actually, we might be able to build better CNNs if we didn't have that assumption of <coughs> rectangular convolutional models. Um, I've not seen any yet, but there will be some. Uh, but then uh, put that down. This, this is um, probably the most famous CNN movement. Um, it's the one with the highest score on some trivial tasks of classifying images. 
I say trivial, trivial for us, but you know, for machine. Um, and uh, it's a Google variant of a thing called the net. Um, and I put that up just to show you that actually these things are quite complicated. What I showed you on the previous floor was basically two of these boxes, but there are many more boxes. So even where you have quite a high degree of dense connectivity at the sort of local level between layers of stuff, usually there are so many layers and arranged in a particular structure that actually you've got a lot of sparsity uh, overall. Um, and also you've got a lot of designed um, features of the structure here. Whoever put this together gave us a lot of prior information, uh, which may or may not be good. I mean, you'd like, you'd like really the intelligent machines to learn everything from first principles. But as with children, we find it useful if we give them some direction. <clears throat> uh, now, there are other things that I couldn't even draw, um, which, but which today are probably even more valuable. Um, so every time you surf the web, of course, thousands of servers clicking together and perform machine learning on what you're doing. Try and work out what you're interested in. Try and work out whether you're similar to other people. For the simple task of trying to sell you stuff, trying to drop adverts on your screen, etc. Um, and they are mapping uh, social relationships and commerce relationships, such as similarity of products and attractiveness of products to. Um, cobalt's people, for example. Um, and those graphs are very, very large and uh, very much less regular than the other ones I just showed you, um, uh, but equally important. So that the field of machine learning covers all this um, and more. Uh, it isn't going to get any smaller. So I just want to sort of emphasize how different a lot of these structures are. There's no one set of algorithms which we need to support in machine learning. There's an enormous set of algorithms for an enormous set of applications. It is the whole of the future of computing, so it's not surprising that it should be large. <coughs> they, they look extremely regular. The uh, interesting thing is actually they're usually quite low dimensional. Um, it's odd. It's a bit like your brain. Your brain looks very complicated. If you, I'm sure you've all seen pictures of neurons going by axons. They look very, very complicated. Um, that lovely picture there, that looks like, to me, that looks like some neurons. That's it's not, that's the internet in 2004. So that's to some scale. <laughs> I always find the similarity between brains and the internet kind of interesting. <coughs> Um, but anyway, they have very low dimensional dimensionality, surprisingly, and, and this arises because uh, things which grow um, usually do so to a set of rules. And in particular, things like the internet and social networks, they grow by what are called <coughs> uh, preferential processes. In other words, a new member coming to this graph, a new vertex coming to this graph, it doesn't just choose where to attach itself randomly, it chooses to attach itself. To, in a preferred way. Um, there is a technical term for vertices that end up acting as enormous hubs of communication in the social world, and that is the Lady Gaga node. Um, there are, <laughs> I think, about one and a bit billion nodes in Facebook's graph, and Lady Gaga purports to be the largest of them. I believe she has 40 million close friends. <laughs> <coughs> um, and of course, Lady Gaga nodes, well, they're well worth knowing about particularly if you've got to partition that graph to do some work on it. And, and they, can be a, they can be a nuisance for the same reason. Um, but this, this tendency to form clusters and hubs uh, goes by two names, small world graphs and uh, scale-free graphs. Scale-free graphs are just extreme small world graphs. You get a small world effect when the clustering is such that the topological distances scale logarithmically. So if you just if you were to build a graph by random attachment of edges to vertices, then you will end up with a binomial distribution of um, node degree. Um, so it's quite it's got peak and it's spread out. Um, when you start clustering things, the small world tends to skew that distribution towards low. You get most people don't have that many friends, and Lady Gaga has lots of friends. 
<coughs> so the average is still the same, of course, because you still have the same number of edges. Uh, we skewed towards lower distributions. And then the scale free is such that the skew is so great that you've basically got the inverse power law distribution of degree. And that gives you a scaling of topological distance, which is log log v, which is almost constant. It's not quite. <laughs> it's almost constant, which is fascinating. It has an amazing properties from scale free graphs. A lot of graphs have been claimed to be scale free, including your brain and the internet and all the rest of them. Actually, that's been challenged quite strongly, so that may not be true, but they, they're sort of heading in that direction. <coughs> um, but the properties of those graphs are particularly important when we just ask ourselves the question of how are we going to distribute workloads on those graphs across a million processes, or in the future, a billion um, processes. Or more. Now, let me get on to some trouble. So first of all, trouble with sparsity. Um, and you can see on this graph the most extreme end of the trouble. Um, so this is sparse matrix vector multiplication. There is a there's an attributed source there, but you can't read it. Um, it is the Lincoln Labs Journal, 2013. Um, so if you look at PDF, I'm sure you'll be able to read it on that. Um, but the point is, uh, they ran for a whole variety of sparse matrices um, and dense matrices. Um, <coughs> so experiments to work out what, how the uh, rate of compute rate of, uh, in this case, a pair of CPUs was affected by sparsity. Um, now, why would it be affected? Well, because sparsity, remember, means that you can't, you, you can't take advantage of access locality to things in memory. So, so if you go fetch a word, then your cache that tries to helpfully fetch all the words next to it um, is wasting a lot of energy and performance by doing that. Um, quite likely that cache line is going to miss, so that's going to go and get DRAM line, which again is not helpful. Um, and then you might apply the word to a microprocessor that's got a supply word floating point data path and you can only use one lane of it. So, so there are those three things really which are catastrophic in the presence of sparsity. Um, as I said a short while ago, almost all of the effort that's gone into tuning processors of one sort or another, whether they're CPUs or GPUs or DSPs, over the last few decades, has gone into structures that try to exploit the assumptions of temporal and spatial locality. And in the presence of sparsity, those assumptions are broken. But they're not just broken, but these things now get in the way. Actually, the line structures get in the way. They make it worse than if we hadn't done it. So, if we're really interested in sparse access and sparse data structures, we have to completely rethink how machines are built. Um, and we'd have to go back a long way to when we started to build caches and line access systems. <coughs> Here's another example. Um, this one's from last year. and. Uh, I don't know if you know, but the University of Florida has taken it on itself to collect everyone's sparse matrices. So it's where everyone goes to experiment on sparse things. There are lots of machine learning examples there, but there are also other things from physics and such like. Um, so I don't know what leaks we've got here. Um, but uh, Microsoft um, are very interested in speeding up machine learning applications and search applications. Which, by the way, search applications now mostly mean semantic search. It means searching for pictures by similarity, searching for things, uh, semantic concepts, uh, which is in fact a machine learning task. So they are very similar. But Microsoft very interested in speeding this up. And this. We've tried using GPUs and not got much of a speed up. Um, so now they're trying FPGAs. Uh, there's a, a project called Catapult Project. Huh? Um, and uh, they're putting uh, quite heavy FPGAs into every server they've got in their data center, and then trying to um, program the FPGAs into deep networks of one sort or another and speed, speed up some of these applications. Um, so you probably can't interpret the colors terribly well. The really pale one is the CPU, and the mid, mid one is the GPU, and the FPGA is the uh, dark one. Um, but what it really shows is that the range of gigaflops that are being achieved, even from some of these very heavy technologies, GPUs now are multi teraflop machines. FPGAs can be bought with multiple teraflops worth of hardware that you can build any structure you like with. Um, but they're all basically failing to deliver. 
Um, and at my rough estimate, is you're getting about 2% utilization of these heavy compute platforms, far average over these sorts of smart structures. So there's a factor of 50 to be got. Now, it may be, actually, but getting it is intractable, or maybe too much work. Perhaps these are the perhaps this is the best gigaflops we can get as a chip. But if that's true, then should we put down all those fair points? So even if this is the best performance we can get, we can at least take out the other 98% of the chip and do something more useful with it, such as a little memory. So too much emphasis on flops. Now, even if we look at really um, structures that you might expect to be friendly to vector machines, we encounter trouble. So FFTs, I mean, obviously the most friendly thing you can do with a vector machine is ask it to do an inner product of two extremely large vectors. So that's the one thing where you might expect a GPU to deliver its to a The second most friendly thing I could think of would be an FFT of thousands of points width. Well, here we are. This is these are it is latest results. This came out in the last year, um, and this is what they get for FFTs. So, so these are pretty good numbers. They may be the best numbers we can get, but the point is they're a tenth of what the GPU was designed to deliver. There's a factor of ten here. If that's the best we can do, because it's fundamentally limited by sparsity and by our I/O bandwidth and such like, then fine. But let's take out the other 90% of the floating point units, save the power, put something more useful there instead. So I'll put that one up just to show that even where a graph looks regular, and FFT is pretty regular, which we're all familiar with FFT lattices, they look pretty regular. And there's enough sparsity there to completely screw up caches and later data ones. <clears throat> Generally what you can do with an FFT is you can get one component of your multiply accumulate string from a dense structure that the other component is being directed through a set of points. The points are going to be dense, but you've still got to do one indirection for each flop. That's, that's usually one of the Okay, so my thesis is that we should build something else. What should we build? Well, uh, perhaps I'm getting cautious in my old age, but I know that com convolutional neural nets, deep neural nets, and current neural nets are very fashionable, and they're also commercially very valuable, and they work. They work better than anything else we've got. They work better than random decision forests and SVMs and all the other things you might have heard of. But 10 years ago, nobody was talking about them. Jeff Hinton, who's a founding father of DNNs, likes to refer to it by saying that last decade, we were the lunatic fringe now at least with a lunatic core. But the point is, he's still not sure whether he's not a lunatic. We know there are various things that are just wrong, like that business of um, transformation invariance. We know that to do vision, we should have somewhere a model of the fact that I am the shape I am, and I'm not bendy and stretchy, at least not beyond certain parameters. So, so if, if I am presenting an image in a variety of aspects, it should still be able to recognise me, it should be able to use that prior knowledge. We have that built into our learned models of how we work. Um, so there's no such concept built into the recognition structures being used today. Um, we also know, of course, that feedback is fundamentally important, recurrence is fundamentally important, but we're just starting to get it to do useful things. The, the work on RNNs is really very, very early. Um, and we'll, yeah, my, my bet is that recurrence will turn out to massively increase the utility and effectiveness of many intelligent machines. I see it in nature. <clears throat> but I don't know that's a hunch. Um, another final example is for 30 years, everyone agreed that all you needed, well, that, that, that as a neural in any sort of neural network, you needed a non-linearity. It's like you need a non-linearity to make a good regression, a logistic regression, non-linearity. And everyone also agreed that it had to have a continuous first differential. It has to be smooth. <laughs> um, and beyond that, everyone agreed that it didn't really matter what shape it was, as long as it was that shape, as long as it was single shape. For 30 years, everyone agreed that. 
And then someone tries to do something that's like a straight line. And it works better. <laughs> and of course, they've got a fancy name called rectified linear units. And now there's a very elegant theory, again come up with by Jeff Hinton, as to how a rectified linear unit, or at least one with a slight sort of bend, which is sometimes called a soft max unit, is actually a collection of biased um, sigmoids all acting all, all that together. But uh, that is the mother of all post rationalizations. The point is, all we need is a ramp. Now, building a logistic into a chip, uh, when you want, say, a million of them every clock cycle, would be enormously expensive. You know, what's the logistic? 1 over 1 plus e to the minus x or something. I'm going to do exponential functions and reciprocal functions in floating point to deliver that. Enormously expensive. Whereas rectifying straight line is nothing. Um, so if I built a machine two years ago, I would have built the wrong machine. Put all my eggs into the wrong basket. Now, so I say you'd have to be very bold or very rich to build a machine that does precisely what all those things I've just shown you does. I don't believe it. I showed you the pictures. I wanted to go through the pictures so you can see they all look like graphs. And so that you can see that they all have certain properties. They have depth, they have complexity, they have high dimensionality, they have sparsity. Oh, and by the way, they're manipulating probability distribution, so they're going to need floating point. But these are the characteristics that we need to capture, not the actual shape of any of those structures. We need to build a machine which can manipulate large, sparse, irregularly connected probability models. Manipulate floating point, but not a DNN CNN machine. That's my bet. Now, obviously, there are people who bet otherwise. The Chinese have just built this. Um, this was presented at the uh, micro conference in Cambridge last December. Um, in fact, it won best paper. Would I thoroughly recommend you go and read the paper? It's a very good paper. It's a very interesting um, thing, and it, and it knocks the spots off the GPU for doing DNNs because that's what it's well, DNNs and CNNs. That's what it's built for. Um, so, really, very impressive work. Um, but I wouldn't have taken made that bet. I think what we need is a flexible parallel processor with the properties that I have just outlined, not a specific piece of hardware for doing any of today's structures. So I moot that we need a third type of machine. We've effectively got two types of machines. We've got CPUs that were designed to manipulate scalar data. Actually, they were designed basically to run Office as far as I can word and Excel, <laughs> ever faster in your laptop. <laughs> and then more recently, in the context of servers in the cloud, they've been used for surgery. Uh, <clears throat> and now they're everyone's control processor. And then we've got GPUs, which are designed to manipulate vectors, um, or at least actually little matrices really, um, as image processors. So I could have put DSPs there as well, they're very similar. If you look at the way the DSPs are involved, they're like a one dimensional GPU. Um, but I think what we, what we are missing. I haven't come up with his name, this is my colleague and CEO, he got a bit of a marketing business, so I would call it an IPU, an intelligent processing unit. Much call it graph processing unit, I can't use GPUs. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> but the point is, it's a structure designed to, um, from the outset, to deal with large structures with, with high degree of sparsity. So you've got to go back to the 1950s. So right, how would we have advanced if we decided that there was no sparsity, no locality to be had because of the sparsity? So we wouldn't have invented caches, and we wouldn't have invented vector as well, and we wouldn't have invented uh, DRAM line structures. What would we invent instead? Now, if you want the same sort of compute performance, you, you inevitably end up deciding that you would have invented rather than <coughs> one big wide machine. You have to invent lots of little narrow ones. And then the question is, how do you get lots of little narrow ones to, to work together? So rather than 1,000 lane wide assembly engine and 1,000 scalar engines, but somehow I've got to get them to communicate and I've got to get them to be efficient. Come to that in a minute. Um, first of all, <coughs> I expect quite a few of you have heard of Mr. Denhardt. Uh, Denard scaling was the sort of, is the complement of uh, more scaling. It basically says as process technology scales, 
we get a huge power saving um, because we're able to reduce the supply voltage. And that huge power saving offsets the fact that we are constantly increasing the density of the compute, which would otherwise make the power go up. Now, unfortunately, down scaling ended in about 2005, so 10 years ago now, at the 90 nanometer process node. Um, some of you may have seen the graphs where the processor megahertz goes up to about five and then gives up. It comes down to about three. And if you buy a computer today, you can bet your bottom of the dollar the CPU will be doing two or three gigahertz. Um, if you look at the projections from 2005, it will be doing about 50 gigahertz. Per so that's the end of Denard scaling. Now, there's conjecture as to whether or not Denard scaling will cause us to go into reverse. The reason why it occurs, by the way, is to do with fundamental physics of silicon. In fact, we cannot reduce the supply voltage. Well, we can reduce the supply voltage, but we will suffer um, superlinearly a loss in performance. So if you're interested in the maximum performance, you can't reduce the supply voltage. Um, so what I've uh, done here is I've taken uh, an existing GPU design, uh, actually a 28 nanometer Maxwell, um, and I have normalized what would happen if you built exactly the same processor in other process nodes, um, backwards and forwards. And uh, what I've assumed is uh, today's sort of hardest limit, which is we are capable of building chips up to about six square centimeters. And we're capable of extracting about 40 watts per square centimeter from a chip. If you look at all of the heavy chips, you'll find that 40 watts is close in. We can't, we don't know how to get any more power out than that. Unless you're going to water cool, I mean, I've never done some crazy stuff. But for normal chips, you look at, you look at how big your fans are, which you can see you're getting 40 watts out per square centimeter, which is quite hard work. For normal chips, that is a hard limit. So, so I have taken a design and I basically said, right, for that process node and that logic, without changing the logic, re-pipeline it as hard as you can up to the 40 watts per square centimeter. How much performance do you get? So it's maximum performance for a 40 watt per square centimeter limit. And you're allowed to change the supply voltage and the clock frequency to get that maximum performance. And this is what happens to the clock frequency. So when we, I mean, most GPUs today are about gigahertz, as we know. To get maximum performance out of a 16 nanometer GPU, you have to take the supply voltage down quite a long way. Now, does that mean the performance has gone down? No, because the density of GPUs, or the photo point units per square centimeter has gone up by more than that's come down. But it means you're well into diminishing returns now. Roughly speaking, you get a factor of two on each generation. So I didn't get twice this, so it still goes up. But the point is I've lost a lot by trying to use up all of that power doing flow point. I think I've shown you before. Why am I doing it anyway? It's actually a waste. So this to me says cramming flow point units in is now wasting silicon. Just like the sparsity argument was. But even if you didn't have sparsity, even if you even if you're doing dense matrix multiplications, probably that's not the right answer. What are you going to put there instead? What are you going to put communications? You're going to build things that allow all those smaller processes to communicate with each other. And by communication, that is mostly memory. Most communication is done through memory. <coughs> now, speed of memory, off chip memory is becoming more useless. In fact, I'd say it's almost got to the point where it's completely useless during during the computation. Um, we are continuing to increase the number of gigabytes per second we can get on and off a dial, but quite gently, and even that is starting to run into some hard limits. <laughs> but of course, what we are doing is we're now trying to put more and more compute parallelism on the dial. So if I started off with a scaling machine and a certain amount of I had with my memory, and then replaced it with a 10 core machine, they've all got to share. Worse than that, even in a scalar world, I can only now afford for each of their caches to be a tenth as big. So they can't actually mitigate the effect of their reduced IO bandwidth. 
So I think, I think in the future, we won't see the chips not having DRAM, for example, but we'll see much more emphasis on DRAM being used to page in bulk work. And when you're actually doing the bulk work, you're doing it on data that's on the chip. So it'll be much less a question of accessing data in external memory dynamically during computation. It'll be paging in computing, paging out again. Now, now the one thing that might change that is the efficacy of vertical stacking of DRAMs. Because if we can go from having a thousand pins to having fifty thousand pins up to a DRAM, particularly fifty thousand very short pins, then that might change things. However, I don't think that's going to solve the problem for long. It's a sort of one-off. <laughs> and even those pins going up to a stacked DRAM burn quite a lot of power. Nowhere near as much power as a, a, a pin going off to a DRAM by the side. They probably have a factor of 10 advantage, maybe a factor of 20. So you get a one-off 10 or 20x on your pin here. But then that's it, you don't get anything. It's also extremely difficult from a silly design point of view. Anyway, this, uh, these curves I thought were quite interesting. This is um, Xeon Phi in 22 nanometers, and this is a uh, Kepler GPU. And uh, this is the, the number of gigaflops vertically versus the uh, flops per byte. And uh, you can see that basically the number of gigaflops that you can feed um, starts to fall off at from 16, well, eight, between 8 and 16 flops per byte. These are single precision flops. So to do anything useful, you need at least four words. So you've got to find 60, well, 30 to 60 floating point operations, even if they're just monadic floating point operations, for every byte that you access in order for this thing to keep up, which is ridiculous. There are no applications. So I would say off-chip memory is already useless. It's just a paging bug. So that's what I think you should do. The plot on the left is a GPU today. In fact, it's a Maxwell class GPU today. That is the amount of memory. The little blue thing is the fraction <coughs> of memory to scale <coughs> uh, relative to the amount of die area that's used for all those very points. And as you've seen, for some things we get in 2% utilization of that logic, for others we get in 10%. It's not going to get any better. It's going to get worse. If you change the ratio by 100 times, the ratio between memory and logic, you get something like this. That to me looks like a much more sensible chip. You could do compute on the chip using data that's on the chip, and you could regard transfers between on chip memory and off chip memory as bulk processes. Bulk processes are much easier to schedule and much easier to hide latencies, etc. They're also much more efficient in the use of bandwidth. <clears throat> so I think the future belongs to distributed machines with enormous numbers for this application, not for a I'm not saying that uh, graph machines will replace GPUs. GPUs were built for a purpose, they're very good at that purpose. It's graphics. They also turn out to be good at linear algebra and HPC, so that's great. Those are their purposes. However, machine learning, vision, intelligence is a completely different class of compute, and they're not very good for that. Now, what you really want is thousands, millions, if you have them, billions, if you have them, of tiny scalar machines, each doing their own thing, and somehow interacting. Now, if you've got a thousand processes on a chip, or a million processes in a rack, they're obviously not going to be sharing any sort of centralized structure. They're not going to be cache coherent. Anyone who believes in cache coherence is beyond about that many. This is man as a brush in my opinion. Well, I've tried to build those things. Crazy, crazy business. I know a Chinese company at the moment that's trying to build something that's 128 weight cache coherent. <clears throat> anyway, um, I don't believe in massively coherent systems. I think this is the future uh, in which we basically have lots of independent small processes that communicate over a fabric which is stateless. There's no centralized control processor and there's no state anywhere in the system except inside those things. They're all autonomous. 
but they all cooperate. And the only thing that they can do apart from send each other messages is synchronize with each other. So hardware to support message transmission, hardware to support bulk synchronization are well worth spending. People have always been afraid of the costs of bulk synchronization, and I think in very early machine. Um, I don't know how many of you have come across the bulk synchronous parallel model of computers, but that was very fashionable for a while, and I think we'll maybe come back for these sorts of machines. Um, and when it was evaluated uh, in the uh, 80s, um, bulk synchronization was an extremely expensive operation, tens of thousands of cycles. Well, you can bulk synchronize, I can tell you, 16 nanometers, you can bulk synchronize a thousand processes on a chip in about 30 or 40 cycles to be delivered, which is no time at all. So um, bulk synchronization is well worth building. If you try to do that software, it took extremely long time, using some sound force and shared memory. Um, and the other nice thing about this pure distributed model is it's completely scalable because you can build a chip like this, you can bolt chips scale on boards and in racks. You can build a data center and you can preserve that purity. All that happens is it becomes harder and harder to support the message traffic and it takes longer to synchronize. I wouldn't say it takes longer to send the message traffic for reasons you'll see shortly. But then I also do believe in threads within each of these elements, because threads are quite good at hiding latency. And if you can hide all of the latency inside these things, then you make it very simple as far as the compiler's concerned. And that's good because the compiler's going to have to work out the schedule between. Um, so multi-threading just to hide local latencies, to hide your branch, to hide your um, first level in your early caches, hide your local memory access, um, hide the latency of uh, complex floating point operation. For example, but no more than that. Don't try to hide latency across the machine, so that, which is what the um, Crane Terra machines try to do. In mean, Note 60, I think they've got 64,000 threads. That's quite expensive. <coughs> right, so how bad will the communication get if we do this? Um, well, if, if we had a random graph, it's a process for forming a random graph, then it's very bad news indeed. As soon as you've got a bunch of processors, then basically every edge in the graph. Fortunately, as I've said previously, interesting graphs, although they're far from them, would have very, very little randomness about them. Um, however, graph partitioning, generally speaking, is NP hard. Um, so, so even if your graph's got a fair bit of structure, unless it's a lattice, something trivial. <laughs> Even if it's got a fair bit of structure, such as it's Facebook's graph, and you can see there's a lady guard on it, okay, that's what's the next biggest node? I'll put that on a different machine because so I don't want them on the same machine. Um, but even, even if it's got a fair bit of structure, it's still going to be hard. So, my view is that's a job for the compiler. And that's a big statement to make because what I'm basically saying is that the compiler will allocate vertices to tiles to those little process elements in a permanent manner. For the lifetime of the program. Static partitioning, no migration of data. That's quite a big statement. I'm also saying that the compiler will schedule the interaction between them. That's a big statement, because now I've made the whole graph structure static. I've allocated it at compiler, both the scheduling and scheduling. Now I think that's a good idea, but I can accept that some may not. <laughs> what you're really arguing about is whether the Graph structure is now part of the program or part of the data. We didn't have this to worry about when we built scaling machines, we just had program data. Now we've got program data and we've got a structure, and the structure defines two things. It defines the partitioning of the state of our model, and it also defines the causality between local updates to pieces of that state. That's what the edges are for. Um, so I would add, I advocate static structure. Fixed graphs. If you want a new graph, you learn a new program because the graph is part of the program. Um, but if you read quite a lot of the work going on in graphs, you find half of them are on my, my side and half are on the different side. Form your own view. Um, how quickly actually will that communication traffic scale? Well, my 
strategic belief in static structures based on that, that's what I've got in my head. The structure of neurons and axons then does not change, and yet my brain can adapt to all sorts of things. So I think the static structure is okay. Um, so how does how do brains work? You've probably seen things like this before. Um, if, if you take mammalian cortexes, this is log log, so actually they look tighter than they really are, but nonetheless it's a, it's a lovely picture. This is mammal cortexes from some sort of shrew up to elephant. Um, and it's the ratio of white matter to grey matter. And white matter is a sort of proxy for internet wiring. And grey matter is a proxy for neurons. They're not very accurate proxies and they vary with uh, cortical thickness. So, so actually the slope of this graph isn't, doesn't quite reflect the ratio of nodes to edges in the neural graph has to be slightly adjusted. So that says 1.23, and actually it's more like 1.33, which says that the topological dimension of cortexes of, of a wide range of sizes uh, is about four. From, so that means that the, the rate at which um, that communication to fabric will have to expand this fellow the rate at which that will have to expand as part of the resources of silicon you have. We'll bring it up as about 1.33 power of the number of these, if you believe that this is going to end up in like a brain. Now, Dan Greenfield from Cambridge, marvellous PhD, various other people have sort of um, spawned work off that uh, not that long ago. But in which he basically showed that um, much complex software operates. Very similar than that, very similar topological, or it's called graph, very similar topological dimension. Uh, and if you characterize um, large chips, you also find the same thing. So it's almost as if if we put a lot of effort into producing structure and a very large, complex graph, then we always end up in some sort of four or five dimensions instead of infinity dimensions. So that's quite a nice result. So I sort of I'd be prepared to build a chip with that sort of scaling assumption. Who knows how it's going to scale? It feels right to me. Um, but certainly, expecting uh, the scaling of random connectivity, which is basically edges going up as the square or a number of vertices, is clearly very pessimistic. And yet, lots of designs have been held back by that assumption. They've assumed the connectivity has to go up as the square. It doesn't. There's another way of looking at connectivity, and that is to say uh, how much power I've got. I'm about 40 watts per square centimetre a minute. So that will limit how much stuff I can send about because it, it burns power to move data on a chip. At 16 nanometers, if we're, if we're really interested in moving data over long distances, we build what are called structured wires, structured wiring panels. So they're wires which have um, partial screens and partial spaces and they're encapsulated by. Um, shield layers so they have lovely signal transmission properties and they have fairly low capacity so they don't burn much power um, but also they're quite fast and then of course we use repeaters and also we use pipelining to make those things travel across long distances so this wire engine not just a piece of copper anymore it's, it's a circuit structure that's quite thought about and this is about the best you can do so you, you can burn you will burn in 16 hours about 10 picojoules per byte per centimeter Assuming half of the wires in your bus change, uh, and only tip, which is an arguable assumption, but a pessimistic one, usually. Um, so, if we build the biggest die that we can, six square centimeters, and we burn as much power as we know how to dissipate, 40 watts per square centimeter, and we allocate, say, half of that to just raw transport, we're going to have to do something at each end, like at least put it in their prison to get out of memory. So, I probably can't use more than half of it. Um, then that allows me to have 1,200 simultaneous transmitters of, of worldwide, so four volts, at about a gigahertz, over something like half the chip radius. So I'm assuming that on average wires have to go halfway across the chip. And that's going to get Manhattan to it. Like that, Bob, like that. <coughs> um, so that's, that's interesting. So that says that. Even if we had 1,200 little processors on a 16 nanometer diet, and they were all talking at the same time, at full clock rate, for dealers or thereabouts, that would be amazing. 
You will have burned all your power budgets so you can't compute at the same time, but actually that's not a problem. And the reason it's not a problem, so that's quite, that's quite interesting. If, if you don't need to send a word for each of those things, you have 5,000 pressures. You send them by per site. So actually the amount, the amount of on-chip transmission is pretty, pretty high. It's, it'll, it'll be power that limits it. So the other thing, I haven't told you how wide that bus would be. But actually, that's not a problem. We can pack, like this technology, we can pack at least 6,500 wires per millimetre on each layer. And you can have up to 16 layers of stuff if you want each new objectives. So the chip area is not a problem. It's the power that will stop it. And the power looks like it would support chips with thousands of little processes on, even if they were all talking at the same time. Um, so speaking of all talking at the same time, and getting towards the end now. So, um, I need to draw thicker lines in my graphs, don't I? In my foils. Uh, bulk synchronous parallel, I don't know how many of you guys have come across this, but the idea of bulk synchronous parallel is if I have a graph, <clears throat> then I can <clears throat> split my computation on that graph into phases uh, of compute alternated with phases of communication. And in a power limited world, this is a really interesting one. So what, what I do is, first of all, I separate my graph into causal layers. So these two nodes have to come first, and then that one has to come, and then that one and that one have to come, etc. So separate it into causal layers and roll it, and then wrap it back up again. So what I've got is a layer of vertex compute, and then a layer of communication. And I loop around that, and each time I loop around it, I only choose some of the vertices to compute and some of the communication paths to communicate over, reflecting causality in that graph. So that graph is a directed acyclic graph. <coughs> now, the bulk synchronous parallel bit comes from the fact that I'm prepared to separate computation from communication, which means that these vertices have slightly special properties. They have to be atomic. So they have to take all their inputs when they go, take all their inputs, compute, produce the output. And there's, there's a guarantee their inputs won't change while they're computing, and no one will look at their outputs until they're finished. So they've got that atomic property with respect to inputs and outputs. But if you can split the program into that, then it will fit into the property of the parallel idea. <clears throat> when they've all computed, then they all exchange data. Now the nice thing about the fact that they all do that at the same time is that the compiler can schedule it to completely saturate any form of non-blocking interconnect. You don't have any dynamic switching in the internet, which saves an enormous amount of power in quite a bit of time. The other nice thing is you can burn all the power you've got, all 40 watts per square centimeter doing compute. And then you can burn all the power you've got doing communication. You can't do both at the same time, which might feel inefficient, but under a power limit it isn't. Because that's what you would be doing if you were trying to do the two at the same time, and this is what you're doing if you're trying to, if you separate them in time. So that, that separates in space. It separates in time. So if you've got a power limited, massively parallel compute system, it's not inefficient to separate compute from communication. Provided when you're doing compute, you reasonably load balance all your little compute engines. And when you're doing communication, you can reasonably saturate your communication fabric. And there are really nice forms of scheduling over that sort of fabric, such as uh, massive square scheduling, which means that everyone can talk and everyone can listen at the same time, at full speed, throughout the process. So you completely saturate your communication fabric. So that's why when I said in this little exercise, that let's assume that we use all the power to communicate, we can in a BSP world couldn't in any other sort of world. What are the alternatives to BSP? Well, one of the nice properties about bulk synchronous parallel is because you'll split your program into DAG sections. Uh, there are no concurrency hazards. So I can build something with a million concurrent processes 
and know that it's race free and deadlock free and live lock free automatically. So a BSP system built out of DAGs, I'll show you how we assemble DAGs in a bit, um, is automatically free of concurrency hazards. So as an ex employee of Inmos, I found that <laughs> um, What are the alternatives? Well, we could we could have used um, communicating sequential processes, uh, or we could have used actors, which are obviously similar. They, require, um, they don't require rendezvous to be exact, so they require buffering or the channel. Um, I'm not too keen on. Uh, actors or buffered channels in general because they use memory and I think I've tried to paint a picture that memory is probably the most precious resource we have on a chip yeah. so the last thing you want is copies of stuff that's why I mean, caches you don't want caches you don't want buffered channels not one copy of everything you move it when it needs to be moved <clears throat> now CSP is an interesting one communicating with sequential processes or messaging by wrong so BSP everyone waits and they all post their letters they all get their letters and then they do the next thing CSP, you have to rendezvous. So a, a sender wants to send something to a receiver. The receiver has to actually acknowledge that you're going to receive it before they can both progress. Now, when we built transputer arrays, that was fine because we basically had one process per piece of silicon. Uh, but in this world, we're going to have models of billion vertices running on machines of a thousand. 10,000 vertices. The point is, you have uh, sorry, 10,000 or 10,000 tiles. But the point is, we have many, many vertices on each of our little compute engine tiles. So when I send, if I want to send something to Vertex on another tile, almost certainly you won't be awake. You'll be busy doing some other thing. So what do I do? Wait. If I do the whole thing, it was a deadlock. Very good. And then what I've got to do is I've got to interrupt him in order for him to receive the message. And if you have a massive mismatch between the parallelism of the task, the parallelism of the program, and the parallelism of the machine, then CSP grinds to hold. BSP doesn't. BSP can saturate communication performance however it wants. So it's a sort of um, this value. This value flashed very uh, BSP in 1990, I think. Uh, Bill McCullough Oxford did a lot of work on it. Um, it, uh, it briefly was very popular and then sort of fizzled. <laughs> and I, th I think it fizzled because it was well before the age when it was efficient. But now that we can build order hundreds or thousands of processes on a, a piece of silicon, it has become efficient. So I think that's the right way to go. Right, finally, a, little, a couple of words on the programming abstraction for machines like this. Um, so what we've sort of invented now in the previous foils is some is a program of two pieces. So you've got a graph that expresses both a factorized data structure, but also the little processes for updating bits of data. Little programs running on the vertices. And it also expresses through its edges the causal dependencies between those updates um, or the sending of messages equivalently. So it's actually, you can't really say that the graph represents part of the code or represents part of the data because it's, it's both. But the program essentially has two layers. We have an outer control program, which is sequential, and that defines the graph to the compiler. <coughs> um, it partitions the vertices into sets which are asymptotic. I say it does, probably the compiler does that, but you may well require hints in the program. You could do it randomly. We can try and get the compiler to extract structure, but you know, we try all to <coughs> parallelization of code and so that's quite difficult. It's probably best to give the user the opportunity to hint, especially since we know there is a lot of structure and things that we can do. And then having defined the graph and acyclic execution sets of vertices, we then run through a procedure of executing those sets and we can respond to what the sets do to decide what that procedure is. So the vertices within each set can execute in any order as long as they respect the causality of the graph. So I can give each of my little compute elements a thousand vertices, and I can make it free to execute in any order they like, so long as they do the right thing over the edges. 
Um, so you can have dynamic allocation of work within the tile, but you've got a static allocation of vertices to tiles by the compiler. So it's the sort of superstructure which is fixed. And then the same applies to for edges. So if edges, then they can be managed by them, you can share memory. Um, but if they move between tiles, then they're allocated by the compiler. Because that's a graph partitioning problem, it's going to be hard. It's the sort of thing the compiler should be doing. Even though it is a limitation on the program, I think it's a good limitation. I feel, I feel almost like in the 1960s, everyone thought you had to allow computers to modify their own code. Computers had to be built with the ability to basically noodle out with their instruction space. Now, very few computers even, even support that as a piece of hardware. <laughs> you know, you have to flush your caches out to some distant part of memory, noodle about with it there, and bring everything back in. Self modifying code turned out not to be useful. It was a freedom that we could usefully deny ourselves. It was one or two specific exceptions. And I feel uh, insisting on dynamic graph structure and the ability to mutate graphs live probably is a freedom to live without. Feel free to argue. In, in about two folds of that. <clears throat> um, so we're going to need some concept of uh, recurrent edges, uh, in which, because uh, these these execution sets are banks, they're directed acyclic, so that in order to allow cyclic behavior, we have the ability to move back. So a recurrent edge just connects a vertex to another vertex in the next iteration of that band, rather than the same iteration. And uh, the control program can read the vertex state, and the vertex program can read the control state. They can't write each other's state. That would be a shared state. Um, but they can read each other's states, and that's, that's quite handy because it means the control program can affect the, the, what the vertices do. Um, deep neural networks, for example. Uh, often, what you want to do is you want to train the network. When you're training, you actually have one set of vertex programs. <coughs> And then when it reaches a certain level of training, you might want to test how well trained it is by running some test samples. So you want to do an inference. That requires the vertices to do something different. How do you make that decision? You make it in the control program. By monitoring convergence properties of the graph and training, and then you can flip in and out of those things. So they do need to see each other's state. The function that the vertices themselves are performing is another sequential program for the vertex. And uh, some of you may have come across the expression coded. Um, it's almost like what a functional programming enthusiast would refer to as a pure function, except it's not pure because it's got state. But it doesn't share state with anyone else. Maybe it's only internal consistent state. Uh, and the most important thing is this atomic property. So these things are multi input, multi output, because you can connect any number of edges to them. They have to have the ability to adapt their function to the number of edges that you connect. So a code has to be able to absorb how many inputs get connected to it. Um, and then they execute atomically. So the inputs are all ready when it starts, they stay constant. Um, it does its job, it updates its outputs. And maybe if nobody responds to the outputs, then it's finished. So that's a, that's a very simple programming model. You could write the code in C, you could write the control program in C, and all you would need to bolt the two together. Bit of library of some magic functions like vertex same, what is my in degree, for example. Um, so it's, it's that sort of programming model is certainly representable in, in any programming language. Um, but if you ask what's actually happening in the cloud today in terms of programming, it's sort of fallen into two schools so far. Um, I wouldn't like to bet how it's going to end up, but in 2010, Google introduced the graph programming framework. And everybody, everybody except my dog, have uh, copied them, or at least tried to improve on them, or whatever. Um, Apache have come up with the giraffe, which is a direct clone, but most of the others are variants on a theme. Uh, and the idea of a graph framework is, uh, as with frameworks generally, you've got this inversion control idea. So you try and think like a vertex is the expression. You write what you would do as a vertex, interacting with all the other vertices. And the software system, the framework, will take care of things like resilience and distribution and partition um, and message transfer between vertices. So again, the programmer has given up some freedom, given up control of the structure. Uh, 
and it will suggest right the vertex program. But it seems to be highly productive in writing. Um, a lot of, well, page rank is always the show off. That's almost the hello world of graph friendly. Um, and people can write in pray or think page rank is about 15 lines of code. So. Um, but there's also another group of um, people who are focused on um, developing frameworks at a higher level for specific structures, so four DNNs, four CNNs, um, and these three are probably the most fashionable at the moment. Um, the torch is based on Lua, the eye is based on um, Cafe C++, I think, but they, they all do the same thing, but you would only use Cafe if you're going to do a CNN, basically. They're not general purpose. But that may be the way in which all these machines get programmed in the end is through application specific frameworks. So anyway, anyway, that's my last my last slide, because everyone always asks me, as will will Moore's law run out of another chip I've got to. Um, well it will eventually, <laughs> obviously. Um, and you may have seen um, uh, uh, one of the um, analysts came up with a chart that did that and uh, that was 28 hours. And this is cost per function. Uh, sorry, functions per cost. <laughs> and they basically put out uh, in, in the financial community very effectively the fact that past 28 nanometers, every transistor got one filter. And um, it certainly scared the foundries, I think, because they're wondering how many people are going to use processes from 28 nanometers. Well, I can tell you categorically. Um, 28 nanometers, sorry, 16 nanometers is scaling perfectly to plan, and the cost is also scaling perfectly to plan. In other words, that, that hasn't happened. That's happened. So we didn't worry about Moore's law for now. I'd say it's why another two or three generations. So if we can build, uh, well, at least another two or three generations, I can't see any further forward than that. It is going to take, I mean, this. The other thing we always read about Moore's law is the time between process nodes. So, so these are real, because I, I ship chips and everyone. <laughs> so these are real numbers. Uh, and in fact, for, for those four, we were the first people to take a chip in that process node in Europe. So I know it's the front end. <laughs> now, at least the front end in Europe, but I mean, there would be an American symbol before us. Um, so these are real dates, and if you look at that slope, it's a uh, new process node every two and a half years. So Moore's law, real, is two and a half years. You, you'll see it reported as 18 months, two years, it's two and a half. Might be three in the future, so it probably will slow down. Um, but if we can build, we could probably build a thousand processes on a chip at 16 nanometers. So we're good up to probably 10,000. So we need software and algorithms and utility for things where single ships have 10,000 independent asynchronous processes going on at once, each of which must be heavily oversubscribed. So you should find program parallelism to use these machines in order at least a million, probably more. I only know one application that's really got that kind of capacity, one large application, that's machine learning. Fortunately, machine learning is exactly what we need to do. So the age of machine learning to me is the age of parallel computing, finally. We've been waiting a long time, but it's here. <laughs> right, that's it. Thanks. Any questions? Yes. Um, back to your slide where you have a uh, uh, number of machines connected to a change. Yeah. Yes. It looks pretty much similar to the local area network. Yeah. And when you say that messages are sent, are they, are they addressed anyway? Um, I conjecture they don't need to be. Because if the compiler is scheduling the exchange and all message communication is synchronized, as it is in a BSP model, then actually all that you need, if, if you're a person with a message to send, all you need to do is to spew it out. And the fabric should know where it's going to go. <coughs> because it's been expecting it. How? And the tile, when it arrives, should know where it should go in the tile as well, because it's been expecting it. 
Does it mean that exchange it is uh, all to all connectivity? Yes. Simultaneous all to all. Latin square scheduled. So we the all compiler needs. selects uh, exact pipe which will be delivering the bytes <coughs> through to the destination, right? Yeah. Well, I don't know whether you've come across Latin square scheduled, but it's, it's, it's a very efficient mechanism for, scheduled, for simultaneous all to all communication. Which is synchronous. <clears throat> and all that anyone needs to know is one master counter of which phase of the exchange process you're in. And if I've got 100 uh, tiles, then there are 99 phases. <laughs> and if I know the phase, then I know where every message is going. And it's a simple modulus calculation to work out where every message should go. So it's trivial. So it's a bit like a local area network, except it doesn't have any dynamic. Routine because well, everything is set up by the compiler and it doesn't have any addressing because everyone knows where everyone's going because that's the moment when everyone's going from there to there. Latin squares basically is you know, the simplest way. To, I mean, there are actually lots of different Latin squares that one can apply, and the simplest one is not the best one, as is usually the case, but the simplest one is the easiest one to understand. <coughs> so, in the first phase, everyone communicates with the guy to his right, in the second phase, everyone communicates with the guy to his right. Third phase, three to his right. And the guy right at the end of the line obviously loops around and communicates to the other one. After 99 of those, I've communicated with everyone, and everyone else has also communicated with everyone, and we haven't collided at all at our ports. That assumes that the fabric can manage up everyone talking at the same time, but that's okay. That's just a question of square millimeters, and it turns out to be an exception number of square millimeters. Now, the reason why that's not the best schedule is because that tends to ramp up the power to a peak in the middle where it's going about halfway and then it comes back down again. <laughs> what you really want is a schedule with a flat ish power consumption. And as is always the case, it turns out to be NP hard to find Latin squares with flat distribution. <laughs> <laughs> <Flat -ish laughs> However, like all NPR problems, a few heuristics get you fairly close. And do such exchanges already exist? Uh, not as far as I know in chips, they exist in uh, some telephone systems, or have existed in telephone systems. Um, what systems? Telephone. Oh, yeah. Maybe not anymore. So AT&T uh, Bell oh, Labs yeah. had the original patents on Latin Square uh, switching. Uh, but that was 1950s or 60s. I'm intrigued by this. <laughs> Way in which you're reconfiguring the silicon with very small process and large memory. <clears throat> and is this, I mean, are, are we thinking this is like an extreme form of risk or is actually that, or are we still going to do full um, distraction setting? Uh, I think the um the little elemental processes, it's probably quite a strong case for them to be threaded rather than superscalar. Right. I mean, superscalar and threading both aim for the same sort of thing. They aim to hide latencies or fill in latency gaps. Um, but in a BSP context of massive oversubscription, where my elemental processor has a long list of work to do, and it's just got to chunk through all that work independently, and then the easiest way and the most efficient way to hide latencies within my own local sphere is by threading. It's cheaper than super scalar. So I don't know, is that risk? Well, okay, so you need <laughs> it's the It's at locality. You need the service for operation for things that can do, can do threading. But I mean, I'm kind of intrigued because- Oh, no, when I say thread, when I refer to multiple threading, I mean barrel threading. So I don't need any semaphores or interlocks, right? Because right? they're all accessing the memory only on their own slot. <coughs> barrel threading, simple, simplest possible form of threading. Yeah. So if I have, if I want to hide five cycles of pipeline latency, I simply pick up five pieces of work and I interleave them in my pipeline. Yeah. It effectively means each piece of work is only running at a fifth of the clock speed. But in the context of massive oversubscription, all that matters is I get through my bulk of work in the shortest time. Not that I get through okay. individual threading. It, it sounds that the actual work is still basically a conventional algorithm. <coughs> Yes, well, it, it's interesting. Some of these, um, some of the structures I've shown, uh, the vertex task is extremely simple. Yeah, it can just be formed in a product of the inputs. 
um, with a set of weights and then pass them through some nonlinearity. So are you talking about uh, processes with inflected um, white persons? Oh yes, definitely. In fact, one thing so that's I should have said from, um, we had a talk a little while ago mm. about uh, the network innovation, which involved uh, a large number of uh, armed processes which didn't have to be. No, that would be Steve Furber. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, bless him. <laughs> yeah, I really wish he did have floating point, but I think <laughs> the army could get hold of didn't have to have floating point. Uh, I think the thing is with um, with these neural networks, all we know at the moment is that we don't need much precision at all. But if you don't have much dynamic range, um, if you don't have much dynamic range, then you have to spend a lot of time constantly rescaling and rebiasing layer by layer. So it's very helpful to have dynamic range even at low precision. Uh, and in fact, there have been quite a lot of um, studies as to how low some of these things can go. And the general conclusion seems to be that some sort of mix of single precision and half precision floating point is quite a good bet, and a better bet than small integers. So if you've got 16 bits, you're better off having a 16 bit floating point than you are having a 16 bit integer, even though you've lost quite a bit of precision. Where 16 floating point would probably be 10 bits of um, fraction, uh, four of exponent and one of sign. You obviously agree, you know, you've mentioned neural nets and you've mentioned real neurons and neural, real brain several times. You're obviously inspired by those models. Mm. And the thing that seems different about neurons is that what they do is very simple to do. And so I'm kind of intrigued whether they will ever go in that direction. Well, I think that what we're discovering about neurons is that they're a little more complicated than we thought and they are uh, much more varied than we thought. So, Obviously, when, when Mr. Head originally started to use the complex structure even with simple components, um, that was a very compelling thought, wasn't it? That we could build lots of simple components. Now, uh, it seems that some neurons have very, very complex internal structure um, and very complex behavior, um, but at the moment we don't know. I, I'm sort of, I am uh, intrigued by neural structure, but I would not describe myself as a neuromorphism enthusiast. I think silicon does things very differently to wetware. We should sort of learn what we can from wetware, but not try and copy it. You know, evolution doesn't always produce the right answers. It, it, evolution yeah. fails to come up on the wheel, for example. We, we don't fly on crazy traffic wheels. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yes, um, or maglev. The evolution didn't come up with that. So, no. <laughs> so um, yes, I, I, at the moment, the neural networks that we're playing around with, we're clearly in kindergarten. That's why I don't think it would be very sensible to build a machine that literally does what we do today. Yeah. What we need is a massively parallel machine that's able to do lots of little jobs. And the interesting thing is about the other little jobs. You know, today, the program that defines what a neuron does in a DNN or a CNN is 20 lines of code. So that's quite good, because in this sort of structure, we've got to re replicate probably a lot of programmatic information. Yeah. But if it's tiny, that's, that's cheap. Um, and actually, I think it'll be quite a while before those programs get a bit more complicated. And I don't think they'll ever get as complicated as some of the sequential control programs we've built. I never expect that you'll have a, a gigabyte of Linux <laughs> running on one of these. These things won't run operating systems. This is a this is a compute engine, the same way as a brain's compute engine. There will still be CPUs. They'll do that stuff. All the complex control operations. There'll still be GPU. Is this I mean you do vectors on this. You, if you give yourself this flexibility, then you're bound to pay the price relative to vector machines. So I don't believe that there's a contest here. I believe in that that um, triumvirate. Of structures, the scalar, dense vectors or linear algebra, and sparse vectors or graphs. Do you have any comparison between this architecture and what's going on, and what has been done previously? Um, I think there are some people. There, there are several people who are clearly exploring the same space at the same time and moving in the same direction. Um, I expect uh, the GPU guys. Lean heavily towards trying to 
decouple their white SIM paths more and more. Um, GPU SIM T, uh, single extraction multiple, multiple threads, is, is <coughs> subtly better in this regard than SIM D, but not much. You, know, you still have a massive cost of any sort of control flow divergence. And control flow divergence here could be something as simple as the fact that I've got two vertices doing exactly the same program, but one's got three incoming edges and one's got five. But they're very rapidly going to get out of step region, even if they're just doing an inner um, so, so control flow divergence in this sort of world, if you have SIM is uh, extremely easy to run into. Uh, I think the, the company, the most credible company effort moving in the right direction is probably the uh, Intel Xeon Fighter. Because they're clearly going to build lots of smaller machines. Now, having said that, uh, they've had so much competitive stress, I think, from the GPU guys that they're putting more and more heavy vector engines in the Xeon Fighter. <laughs> That's now up to half the width of the a really big GPU. I think they've got um, 512 bits wide, <coughs> which for this sort of stuff is clearly moving in the wrong direction. There are lots of other companies doing interesting stuff. Um, IBM with their uh, Blue Gene project tried to build larger numbers of smaller machines and get them to operate, uh, certainly at system level, in their thousands and tens of thousands. Um, part of that program has spawned Watson. I don't think IBM will take that to its logical conclusion, but I do know there's a team from Watson, a chip team from Watson, trying to get funding to take it to the next level. Um, so that's a possibility. Qualcomm have got a uh, wholly owned subsidiary called Brain Corporation, and uh, they don't suffer fairly neuromorphic, but I suspect they might break out of that. I mean, there are two ways to do it, aren't there? You can either build something that's DNN like today and try and Increase its flexibility over time, or you can take today's processes and try and focus them, which I think is what we do. Uh, and then there's also another um, IBM team called uh, uh, True North, which is a neuromorphic type architecture. So if you like, IBM got bets in both the conventional CPU multiprocessors and the neuromorphic side. But I, I do find it amazing. So at the moment, in the venture world, so, so this sort of innovation, you know. What do we do next stuff? Um, historically, it's come from startups. That's what startups are for. They take high risk, or at least their investors take high risk. A lot of the time, it doesn't work. When it does work, then a company with big resources and funds can buy that piece of innovation. <coughs> Sometimes a startup becomes public, but most of them, they get bought. They are, startups are a pipeline for innovation, which can then be sold. Um, now, the interesting thing is that since uh, first of all, the 2000 tech collapse, and then more recently the banking collapse. Uh, silicon, uh, in fact, hardware in general, has become deeply, deeply unfashionable in venture investment space because it's perceived as being expensive and having a very long gestation period. Uh, actually, it's nowhere near as expensive as <coughs> quite a lot of the software business model ventures that have been backed, but it does have a long. Uh, gestation period. It'll take 10 years to build a new certain story. Um, well, having said that, Facebook, I think, took 10 years and $800 million in venture investment. <laughs> um, so I, th I think at the moment, fashion is kind of against silicon for slightly, and it's slightly rational. Um, and I don't, I don't say that because I think people should be investing in my company, but because if you look at the amount of investment in dollar terms that's going into software for machine learning, and then you look at the fact that there's nothing going into hardware, virtually nothing going into hardware, that's got to be an imbalance. If, if it's worth tens of billions of dollars for the software, then surely there's a question, can we build hardware that makes this software better? And I think there are lots of people who agree that we can. So surely that's got to be worth some investment. Anyway, we've managed to get our own way of doing it. <laughs> I hope repurposing another company. <laughs> That's a slightly curious way of doing it, but it will work. So we'll give it a go. It will be ours. I know of three other uh, startups who are funded to try and build machines to tackle this market, um, but none of those three yet are very well funded. They're, they're seed funded, if you like. But uh, no further than that. But I hope some of them will be. We might be the only one who might think we're wrong. 
and in terms of others going in this direction, the, the choice of kind of compiling in the, mm. the communication mm. and, the, and sort of the, the, the bet on um, mm. that, that sort of fixed structure strikes me as quite a, a big upfront decision and quite a commitment in terms of how it affects everything that's developed from that point of view. It is a big decision. Is, uh, uh, but it's not as big a decision how, as... How, many, how uh, the others going in this direction, are they right. do, doing something similar or, or different in terms of that decision? Uh, so, of the, ones, know. of the ones I know, all the others are going to build something much more hardware specific than that. So, so two of them are going to build CNN specific machines, and one's going to build a DNN specific machine. So it's a much stronger assumption. <laughs> so I haven't gone that far. But you're right. That's so, so, but nobody's going more flexible. No. No, not well, not amongst, or not yet. Not amongst the startups. I mean, obviously, the process of communities constantly adapting to opportunities. I know one large Chinese company um, who are very specifically at the moment building a chip that they expect to use for network processing. Now, I don't know if you ever looked at network processes, but they are they're interesting because they, they're not dissimilar to these. Mm. They usually have quirky instruction sets to do things like packet assembly and disassembly. But in terms of superstructure, they're not a million miles from this stuff, and they're quite used to putting hundreds of them on a chip and building big heavy chips. Um, so this Chinese company, I know that they are trying to build a network processor which, after it's satisfied its network processing goals, can be used for machine learning acceleration in the cloud system. So we may see some competition from, the from, innovation device, that's from right. network processors. I think that's probably quite a good direction. The thing is, I would caution though, it's very difficult for companies to do more than one job. So, you know, if you're very good at a particular job, you tend to just carry on doing that job. That's why Intel are hopeless at adapting to doing anything else on the block and using the computer. And Qualcomm with their brain core, I doubt they'll get into neuromorphic computing in any significant way. They're, they're great at producing cellular modems with what they're going on doing. So that's, that's often the case. That's why, that's why startups are effective at producing new directions because they're not held back by any sense that you know, because they have a hammer, the problem must be in there. <laughs> I think that I think to be honest, the GPU guys are in that space right now. They built a team. They built a a very good answer for graphics. And now visions come along. Subset machine learning, and they said, "Oh, vision, that's pictures like graphics. Therefore, it must be the same." Because you couldn't get further away. It's completely different. You know, one's <laughs> one's computationally deterministic, and the other isn't. There's a pretty pretty good difference to start. <clears throat> but you know, it's good marketing, is it? Pictures, video pictures. Visual computing, I think they call it. Nonsense. They do 2D to 3D. Sorry, 3D to 2D. 2D to 3D is the hard thing. Um, so I suspect that they won't be very good at it. I suspect the people who are really good at it will be new people. You know, maybe it's us, but it could be other new people. You come at it with a fresh sheet of paper. Um, I think we'd better call it quits there. I think we've uh, extended way beyond what we have promised. But uh, thank you very much, um, for everyone. Uh, I've got three announcements. So, this is our last um, talk for this season. So, uh, look out for the next series of talks in October. Um, it will also be the AGM in October. So, if you have uh, ends up,